it's it's almost the end of the year. Mm-hmm. It is December tenth, eleventh. What's today? I think it's the eleventh. I think we're on the eleventh now. Mm-hmm. So December eleventh, two thousand nineteen. The year is coming to an end. We started this at the beginning of the year, and we aimed to finish this entire book. Yeah. And we've done it. We've both finished reading this book. Mm-hmm. Um, but we stopped doing these um, discussion sessions, and we were at the beginning of part six. Yeah. So I say we just go through as much of it as we can. Yeah. And um, we've come a little bit early today, so we've got extra time, and let's just go through it okay so part six begins with chapter 27 the Mm. government and the market and from the study guide made by robert murphy uh, the first study question for this chapter is under the heading the idea of a third system what is the third way what are its characteristics Presuming there's a controlled economy, um, like a, a state economy, a Volkswirtschaft or whatever that's called, a um, free, totally free market economy, and then I would say finally the third way is a mixed economy, yeah, so called. And what are its characteristics? Um, It has prices and um, wages and um, factors of production and all these, like, terms, but they're terms only because Mm -hmm. they're dictated. Like, the government says, well, you have to pay this much minimum wage. Um, So they're interfering with the free market. So it's not a free market. It's not a totally command and control economy. Um, but that's the third way. Right. Two, the intervention. What are the two patterns for the realization of socialism? Two patterns. Um, From my recollection, there's a straightforward way, and then there's a more subtle way. And I I think the subtle way has to do with through taxes. Um, Does it say anything in the... Yeah, yeah. uh, It says here in the book, um, there are two patterns for the realization of socialism. Under the Lenin or Russian pattern, all Mm. enterprises are formally nationalized right and become bureaucratic extensions of the state in contrast in the hindenburg or german pattern the appearance of a market is retained there are nominal nominal shopkeepers who pay wages and earn revenues but these numbers are a sham as all activity is directed by the central authority Mm -hmm. so i think that's even more direct than what I was describing, where I'm like, the government sets a, a minimum wage and you get, have all these choices in between. Yeah, that's It's like, you pay shopkeepers this much and... <laughs> you earn this much revenue. Yeah, your employees... Yeah, exactly. Everything is, is <laughs> commanded. It sounds so silly. I can't imagine that ever being a thing, like, nowadays. Like, that ever... I mean, I guess it, it exists around the world. Yeah, um, what's it, the expression about socialists are all mini dictators? So yeah. they, they believe that they have the answer right. of what a, that wage should be. Mm-hmm. They know what this grocery store clerk needs to make. What distinguishes interventionism from the German pattern of socialism? So the interventionism is really more straightforward, I'd say. They formally announce this is what's happening. So I guess that's more honest, if you want to use that word, of what's happening. Hmm. Yeah, it is more honest. 
Um, what does government interference always imply? I'd say force. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Or the threat of force. Yeah. Um, right. Because that, that's, that's the really only like distinction the government has. Right. They're not, um, they're not involved in market activity. Mm-hmm. They're not offering a, a good or service in exchange for a different kind of behavior from the um, businesses. Right. They are threatening to bludgeon them or cage them. That's the only tool in the toolbox. Yeah. <laughs> uh, comment. The essential feature of government is the enforcement of its decrees by beating, killing, and imprisoning. Hmm. Yes. Number three, the delimitation of governmental functions. There's a comment. Quote, the notion of right and wrong is a human device, a utilitarian precept designed to make social cooperation under the division of labor possible. That sentence really stood out to me when I read it the first time in the book. Yeah, I I remember that. Um, What do you think about it? I think it's awesome. I mean, the the notion that morality and right and wrong, which I always had a a strong, you know, affinity for more like morality and moral studies, um, but sort of lacks its uh, foundation. Like, why and can there be a universal morality? But it makes sense to ground it in um, division of labor. That morality is a human concept that arose from the need to depend on others for things. Mm-hmm. And so we have to do the right thing so, so that we're not screwing each other. Yeah, so the game works. Yeah, exactly. And we can have nice things. Um, yeah. Does Mises think thou shalt not kill is part of natural law? Hmm. I don't really know Mises' thought on this. No. No. He doesn't. Oh, right. Remember, he says, um, obviously, animals depend on killing Mm. in order to survive. Um, The thou shall not kill commandment is is a human one, Mm -hmm. not part of natural law. It's part of human law because of our need to um, have division of labor. Oh. This must be yours. Oh. I discovered a, a piece of paper. I'll leave it in there. Number four. Oh, we're still on this. Okay, yeah. I have a picture of the next chapter. Oh, right. okay. Oh, you don't have these questions? I, I just forgot to take pictures of that oh, one. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. we're going to finish this one. Number four. Righteousness as the ultimate standard of the individual's actions. Why would the market economy become a chaotic muddle if the predominance of private property, which the reformers disparage as selfishness, is eliminated? Yeah, so I think pretty much every, like all progress is made through property rights because if you don't, if you if you don't have to protect your capital, there's no reason for you to take care of anything, I guess, and maintain it. It's kind of the same thing with the, um, with the farmland. And if it was, um, if you didn't own your farmland, you would just seek the largest short term gain you could possibly do and possibly and ruin your farmland in the long term. Um, so I forget the exact question, but this concept applies to everything. Like if you don't, if you don't own something, you're going to seek to maximize the short term gains. Right. Very well put. Probably be- because you can't benefit from it. You can't um, reap the rewards from improving it. 
Right. If you don't have property ownership, then there's less of a chance in the future that you will be able to benefit from it. Yeah. So you want to maximize your benefit. And if you have access to it now, you want to just get all the benefits right now. Yeah. Like I don't waste time getting an oil change on a rental car. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, what is wrong with the desire for an altruistic entrepreneur? So they break this down. So there's no such thing. Like if I was selling any pay mugs, but <laughs> you know, I, $10 is, no, I, uh, $10 is too much for a lot of people. They're too poor yeah. to buy any pay mugs. Right. So I'm, I'm going to be altruistic and I'm going to say, I am going to sell any pay mugs so f- to the poor people. So it's like, okay, so how much ten dollars is too much. So how much do I sell them for? Do I sell them for five dollars? So now like some some more people can afford these, but there's still people that can't afford this five dollar mug. So it's like where do I where do I draw the line? And like how poor is too poor and then eventually it goes to like okay i'm giving away any pay mugs and that that i'm not an entrepreneur at that point that is a brilliant point yeah very well put um i I forgot that part of the book until you just reminded me yeah and i thought that was an outstanding section yeah it applies to really everything it's like you can't draw arbitrary lines like um, in doing moral actions. It's like it you, it doesn't serve any purpose because yeah. Yeah, there's always going to be someone who's more poor or can't afford two of them. Mm-hmm. You know, if everyone else can afford two or ten, it's like. There's always yeah. going to be someone less. And then, like, if, if you keep going out with the example, like, okay, if I, I can sell them for $10 now, and maybe I do that success, successfully for a year, and then I ramp up production, and I can start driving the price down so that more people can afford it. Yeah, I think... That's I, the more altruistic way, in my opinion. I believe that's what happened with steel production and oil refining in the Mm -hmm. 1800s. Um, Prices went down for things that poor people needed. Yeah. Why does Mises think the doctrine of just prices and wages would have arrested economic development? Just prices and wages. It seems like um, that's the other, they're making the moral argument for something that has to do with economic calculation. And you see a lot of those problems that we just talked about arise. Yeah. When you give a fair wage. Yeah, it's the same thing um, as altruistic entrepreneurs but with uh, rather than the price of the goods it's the price of the labor Mm -hmm. why should the sermonizers appeal to consumers rather than producers who are the sermonizers I think just evangelists people who are saying like um, those people shouldn't sell out those shouldn't sell heroin they shouldn't sell alcohol they shouldn't oh. sell bad stuff cigarettes you, right why should they appeal to the consumers because they're they're them? the ones that vote yeah <laughs> yeah with their dollars yeah. and their money <laughs> yeah five the meaning of laissez-faire what is the definition of laissez-faire What would you say? Hands off. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. That's kind of what I... Yeah. I think that's literally what it means. Yeah. 
Does the market rely on automatic forces? Yes. Can you elaborate? So, the automatic forces would be the collective of all human action in, within the market. So, I guess it, it's not, it functions automatically um, through everyone's separate actions. And I guess that's how it operates. Like, uh, entrepreneurs rely on signals from the market to produce and then consumers interact with the market based on prices yeah it's so exactly um Mises points out that originally laissez-faire was used by the french liberals who wanted to um eliminate the bureaucrats who were interfering with their entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. and that in modern times, laissez-faire is used as a term um, to suggest doing nothing in an unsatisfactory condition. Like, oh, well, um, you know, these people's arms are just flying into the the meat grinder as they're packaging meat, but you know, oh, laissez-faire, don't do anything about it. <laughs> And it's, you know, it's used disparagingly. Yeah. <sighs> Six, direct government interference with consumption. Comment. Every act of government interference with business must indirectly affect consumption. Another comment. If one abolishes man's freedom to determine his own consumption, one takes all freedoms away. Quite. Well, that was excellent. What a great chapter, Mises. Uh, the next one is titled Interference by Taxation. Cool. Let me... Okay, I got it too. Shall we? Yeah, so one, the neutral tax. What is the definition of the neutral tax? Um, I don't remember. Um, I'm reading the notes about this. The, the goal of neutral taxation where prices are not disturbed by the system of taxation mm -hmm. is unachievable. So it's an imaginary type of taxation where um nothing is affected you, <laughs> you get your lunch for free yeah it's amazing but i think this is how most people believe taxes i've heard work. the term like in the mainstream before neutral oh, really? tax oh uh, yeah you just you know you just take the money and there will be no consequences about people making different decisions one way or another mm -hmm. Why do governments generally adhere to the ability to pay principle in tax policy? I would say because on the on the surface it 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 sounds good and appeases the masses. What sounds good exactly? What's the, the ability to ability pay The ability to pay principle. Um, it's the based on if you have more money you pay more. Oh right 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 right. Yeah, it it seems like it's a, a populist kind of belief that I don't know majority of people would like on like oh, okay yeah yeah you have more money you pay more yeah because it all just happened randomly yeah uh okay yeah that makes does the sense. does it say anything in the notes um let's see. No, no, it doesn't say anything about that in particular. The total tax, too. What is the definition of the total tax?
I don't know. <laughs> I, I, am I looking? Maybe I'm looking at the wrong chapter here. Okay, the total tax. Oh, taking the ability to pay principal to its extreme, one can imagine a total tax where the government confiscates either all income or even all wealth and then distributes it back to its subjects according to ostensibly just rules. Hmm. As a form of interventionism, the total tax is clearly useless. It either delivers outright socialism or gives the wealthy the incentive to cease working and consume their capital. Right. Yeah, it seems like a totally crazy idea. I'll bet it's... I, I'm, it sounds crazy to me, but I'll bet there are plenty of people who would support the idea that all wealth is confiscated and redistributed according to just rules. <laughs> what would be the incentives for the capitalist and entrepreneur, entrepreneurs under total tax? And I think you consume. Yeah. Three fiscal and non-fiscal objectives of taxation. What distinguishes fiscal objectives from non-fiscal objectives? Give an example. Hmm. I feel I feel like the non-fiscal objectives are of taxation is to this concept of fairness. People always like uh, talk about taxes and what's fair, and that doesn't seem like a it seems like a moral objective rather than a financial one. Uh, for example, taxing liquor to prevent people from drinking. Um, I would say like you hear it a lot with the the wealth tax. It's like um, they want they want everything to be fair, and like uh, I think Elizabeth Warren's big thing is she keeps talking about you made all these billions of dollars, but you used our roads, so it's only fair that you give me your money. I think that's the their non fiscal objective. It doesn't uh, yeah, it doesn't sound like uh the objective of the tax is to achieve, you know, oh we need to raise this much money. It's more of uh everyone needs to be on the same playing field. So there's two different types. There's the fiscal objective which is she wants the money. Right. And then there's the non-fiscal objective, which yeah. is she wants to punish people. Who right. I don't even think she wants the money because they don't. They're not concerned about the money. They're just going to print more. They <laughs> want the. <laughs> they want the social, like they they want the the idea of it being fair. That's what they. They don't care about the prices of anything. They just. They want everyone to feel like they're in a fair system. Well, if she did care. Uh, about collecting money, I think that would be a fiscal objective. Yeah. As an example. But right. I think you're right that <laughs> most um, politicians don't consider taxes even a, a necessary form of raising revenue. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> How can taxation destroy the market economy? It, it it distorts market signals. It creates more noise that entrepreneurs have to um, work through to understand what the market's telling them. Yeah, and furthermore, taxes on uh, things like um, there was a ten dollar flat tax put on all cigars in New Jersey, mm -hmm. and all of the cigar stores went out of business because they're just right. like. We can't do it. Mm. The market is now gone. So it completely destroyed the market. And they moved it to online where people could ship from Hawaii or whatever. The place had no tax. Right. How can excessive taxation undermine itself? Like exactly what you just said. So, you know, the, the large tax they passed 
well, now that all the businesses are closed, so you get no tax. Yeah, exactly. Boy, that was clever. The three classes of tax interventionism. Give a short overview of the three classes of tax interventionism. I'm, I'm not sure on these. Ah, I have these up on my current page. Juan. The tax aims at totally eliminating or restricting the production of definite commodities. The tax aims at eliminating or restricting the production of definite commodities. Okay, so I guess that would be like taxing What is something they want to totally eliminate? Like cigarettes? Yeah, but okay, yeah. Or, yeah, that yeah. seems right. Eliminating or restricting. Or even stuff. like New York's like a soda tax. Right, sugar, like, the, the soda yeah, tax. That's a perfect I think Bloomberg example. just talked about it. It's like, yeah, we want to tax the poor people so we can tell them <laughs> what to buy. He said that in the like interview. It was funny. Uh, uh, the, the two, the tax expropriates a part of income or wealth. And three, the tax expropriates income and wealth entirely. It's the three classes of tax interventionism. Aims at eliminating or restricting production, expropriates part of the income or wealth, or expropriates all the income and wealth. Okay. Three forms. That's it for that chapter. Oh, well done. Cool. So that was 28. We're now at chapter 29. Restriction of production. Does it start with um, the government and the auton autonomy of the market? Is that the right question set? I may have missed one, but I believe that it begins with the chapter titled The Nature of Restriction. Oh, okay. I got it. 